And I have started the recording, so we will get started. And again, thank you very much for taking the opportunity to meet today. Uh, again, the topic of discussion today is the Relay Staff Portal. We are going to be utilizing the Dalhousie portal environment within the call environment. So uh, if you've got any questions or concerns surrounding any of the uh, the uh, requests or processing that we see through this environment, please uh, ask at any time. And from your staff environment, you will be asked, of course, to enter in a user ID and a password. I've taken the liberty of configuring administrative user login for us through call. And when you log into the environment, you will be taken to you know, uh, an environment that takes you by default to the query request function. So for those of you who are not familiar with this function, this should be uh, a function that's very similar to the Windows-based query request function that you have from your login application in Windows. Uh, also, we did have a similar query function in the older Relay access forms. We do have the ability to query on a specific request number or again, a variety of other options that you may configure to display, including things like the number, the barcode, the OCLC number, uh, ISSN, ISBN, etc., etc. And when you perform a search, you will either get a single request number or uh, a listing of requests that you can select from. And I'm sorry, Detta, did you have a question? And I'll... No, sorry, I just joined. Okay, no worries. Thank you. Sorry. So again, in addition to our exact number search up at the top, which again defaults to this number, we also have the ability to query on a variety of other fields or combinations of fields of information. Again, this is the call production environment, so I'm not entirely sure of where specific requests are. So if I was just to go back and search for requests that were entered from Monday to today, uh, entering my search criteria and clicking search. Again, this is likely going to return a variety of different requests. So again, I do see that because we're in a consortial environment, there are requests for Acadia, requests for Dell, requests for a variety of members. And again, they're in a variety of different states. And I'm just going to click on one of these requests again from the grid and what you will see associated with the request will give you um, a brief amount of information associated with that request. Tabs of information may open up to allow you to do certain things with the request, depending on where the request is in the system at the point where you've selected. And we'll talk about all the various tabs that can be presented a little later in the, in the session. Down towards the bottom of the uh, that pops up is the audit history of your request. So again, we can see for this request, it was added uh, back on the 4th or today, or earlier today, move to next ran and move the request into search auto, search auto ran and move the request into search manual for review. And we can see that our request is in our search manual patron queue where it's awaiting processing at this point in time. So again, that's a brief amount of information about your uh, query and selection of a specific request. You will see that just like we have in the Windows environment uh, on that query function, we do have the ability to view or reprint, reprint a request. Again, this will give you the electronic implementation of the pick sheet or cover page that you've got configured. Again, this calls up a reportal request form that allows you to both view and there is options up uh, under your uh, environment to print to the default printer associated with your workstation. Again, when you use the view or the reprint function, it does open up uh, another tab so that you can close and come back uh, to the request um, and do whatever you need to do after you've printed. You might also notice that there is an option up at the top of the screen here because we've called up a grid of requests. Uh, there may be uh, a desire to take the results of this grid and uh, print them off or, or create a CSV file that you can use outside of Relay. So again, if you see the export request function, that is simply for the listing of requests that have been returned, you have the ability to generate a CSV file 
which will include a variety of different fields of information that you select and associate uh, with the requests that have been returned. So again, you'll see by default, this list is including things, common things like request number, title, author, publisher, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But there are a variety of other fields of information, oops, sorry, uh, that do appear in the grid on the right. And if I wanted for some reason to include things like the service type, I can simply drag those and move those over and service type will appear uh, in the list of options that's selected. When I click download, that will create the CSV file on my local workstation in my default download uh, directory. And again, you can take that file and do whatever it is that you wish to do with that export file of information. Again, you should see the export request function uh, anytime that you see a grid of results that there's in the staff portal environment. So again, that's really all I wish to cover on um, the query request function. Again, it is very similar to that that you should be familiar with from the Windows environment. We can default the query to look at open requests versus all requests. We can do a sort based on request number or sending order, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If you do not want to see these options by default, we can, of course, change the uh, query request screen for your institution to suppress the default display of all of those options and have you click on the more options to get this information. Uh, again, all of the screens that you see in the staff interface will be customizable on an institution by institution basis. Mark. Yes. While you're on the screen, could you just show people that under the request type, they can pick their individual institution to get their yeah. request? Absolutely. So in the search okay. before I had selected my dates of from Monday to Wednesday, there is also, of course, the request type drop down so that if I am looking only for Dalhousie regular requests, for example, I can select that value and click search. And when the search goes out, you'll notice I don't see all those other request types that I saw before. I now see only my Dalhousie regular requests. Does that uh, respond to the question sufficiently? Yes, it is. Excellent. So the next function that I was going to show was the search function. And for some reason, I'm not seeing the search screen. And uh, if you'll bear with me for a moment, I'm just going to see if somebody has changed the default login ID and password that I used. Or Joe, can you confirm that the search auto application, the, the staff search was configured for Dalhousie before today? Yes, that was my yeah. understanding. Okay, so yeah. it's probably just my login. If you bear with me for a moment and with apologies, I'm just going to quickly go and do a, a database query and find out what has happened to my what has happened to my user? Spelling counts. And shall we? Hmm. 
I will come back to the search later on in the show because it seems to be missing for some as yet to be unknown reason to me. Um, apologies. So and there should be, if you've got it configured, the ability to conduct a staff search. That functionality will allow you to conduct a search against the configured Z3950 target or target groups uh, to identify a piece of material that uh, may want to be requested either from a patron or, heaven forbid, another institution. And from there, you can generate the request on behalf of that patron or on behalf of that library. And again, this would be just like that functionality that you have in the Windows environment, where if you were to go to patron registration or library registration, you could create a request on behalf of them. The difference is you're doing that based on a discovery search to identify where the material may be sourced before you actually create the request. So again, we'll come back to that one. I do have as a minimum that configured in my RC environment to show you that. Moving down our side menu, and again on the left hand side, this is what Relay likes to define as our side menu of features and functionality. The next option that you're going to see typically, and again, this is if it's configured, is the ability for staff to change their password. So again, this interface, if I, oops, sorry. If I select my change password option, if I've enabled it, uh, what the system will ask you to do is enter in your current password. And so again, I will just go ahead and enter in my existing password. And then the system will ask you to enter in a new password. And that new password can be established based on strong, medium, or weak password. Uh, you can either use the password that's auto-generated or you can create your own. And again, whether or not we're looking for strong, medium, or weak password, again, is based on configuration within the portal system itself. And again, that portal configuration is configurable in a configuration environment by each institution. So if Dalhousie wants their staff to use strong password all the time, but Memorial decides that they're uh, interested in a medium password, that certainly is something that can be accommodated. Again, I'm not going to go ahead and change my password, but if I did, I'd simply click Submit, and the system would tell you that the password has been updated. And I'm just going to clear this at the moment because I don't want to do anything. If all that is your change password option, again, the idea here is that if staff um, want to change their password periodically, that is now available through the staff portal interface. I'm going to scroll down a little bit. Hopefully, uh, everybody can see this and doesn't mind. The next section of our side menu uh, is uh, a little bit busier section. It's broken up into our requesting and supplying side of the house. And again, I'm suppressed these by default. By default, they all show up as expanded so that you can see additional information. The portal environment is in the side menu, uh, giving you the same queue based review of where your requests are. Uh, just like the monitor queues function within your system. The difference in coming into the staff portal environment is that there is logic in the portal to understand who has logged in, i.e. the staff member that's logged in is associated with an institution within the consortia. So it is only going to return to you the request details, either the supplying side request details or your requesting side details for requests associated with Dalhousie. So on the supplying side, I've got my variety of different queues as defined by the request flow. Again, I've got some requests in distribute requests. I've got some requests in request processing, I've got some requests that are down in delivery. If I drill into any of these queues, and I'll just go into request processing, you'll note that I am only seeing requests where, in this case, Dalhousie is the supplier associated with the request. So I do see in the consortia that I've got an Acadia request from another from an Acadia patron. I've got a Memorial patron request, and I've got a bunch of lending requests that have been sent in to Dalhousie to be serviced. They are in my supplying side request processing scanner update inter internal queue. And again, if I wish to take a or look at any of the requests in this queue, just like you can through monitor queues, you can simply click on the request. The, again, constant data associated with the request will display. And based on where the request is in the request flow, you again will see those tabs of information that appear that allow you to 
update or process the request based on where the request is in the request flow. In this case, my request is in scanner update internal queue, meaning that we've printed off our pick slip, we've gone to the stacks, and hopefully we found the material. This is a request for a copy, so the logical tab to display by default is our supply tab, which allows you to either add a document to the request or indicate that the request was being supplied via some other method like fiche de paper, photo, um, FTP document, and again, the variety of document supply codes that you configured in the call environment. Again, we can switch, so if you decide you're not going to copy the material and you do decide that you wish to loan it instead, you can click on the Loan tab, and that will give you access again to the ability to loan the item entering the item barcode associated with the piece of material that out the door, validate your due date using the calendar or otherwise, uh, marking the request as renewable or non-renewable. And again, these toggles are set based on configuration within the system. If the normal policy is to not renew, we should change that to be a no. Again, to find any item types or conditions that you've got associated with the request, and you can process the request as a, as a loan instead. Just like you have in your request processing environment, we have other tabs that are available. Again, we have the ability to unfill the request. And again, the unfill is selecting a um, cancellation or an exception code associated with the uh, material to, again, indicate that Dalhousie is unable to service the request because. And again, picking from the selected uh, reasons will update the request and direct the request to the next logical place in the request flow. It's a patron request. It may direct to another supplier within the request routing list. If it was a lending request submitted to Dalhousie, it will likely be canceled and send a message off to the requester saying, I'm sorry, I can't fill your request because. The Bib Info tab that will display when you see the Bib Info tab uh, will give you access to, again, as the name suggests, all the bibliographic data elements associated with the request as entered by the requester. Again, just like your edit request function from the Windows environment, you have the ability not only to review, but to edit any field or fields of information that happen to appear on the screen. And when you click update, of course, that will simply update the information um, and uh, store that information in the database for the request. If you're making updates and you get sidetracked, just like you can in the Windows environment, if you haven't clicked update to store your request, you can click reset and that will reset the form back to the known uh, database data elements for each of these fields before you started making the changes. Just like you have uh, in the Windows environment, again, we have the ability to add a note at any point in time so that if I happen to type in a note in here and click update, that, that note that's added by staff will be added to the audit history of the request. So the next per staff member that comes in to review the request will have a full audit history of what was done with the request and any notes that staff wanted to relay in the audit history. So that's our Bib Info tab. We recently also added both the delivery info tab, which not surprisingly gives you access to the delivery information associated with the request. So then in this case, we see that we have our uh, publication type of a copy and a journal. You'll know that because I am looking at a memorial request, this is a memorial patron request, because Dalhousie is the supplier, you may be able to view this information, but I am not able to change anything because only the library associated with the requester is able to change the delivery information associated with the request. Likewise, if I look at the request info, our request info has a variety of other request related information. And again, the delivery info, request info, and bib info are all providing you with the same information that you ha would have from the edit request function from your Windows environment. So again, we have things like need by date, the ability to record or view an external number or a doc line number, project code if you're using it, copyright compliance statement if you're looking for it, uh, max cost, OCLC number. If you're using RAPID, the RAPID request ID will appear on the request info tab. And again, an acknowledgement statement that you can select to ensure that somebody has made the right acknowledgement when they're placing the request. The other tab that's not displaying here right at the moment because the request hasn't gone 
far enough in to do it is the um, request routing option. And that would again give you access to the requ request routing function, which you're all hopefully familiar with from the Windows environment, either from search manual to manually build a routing list or from the review and uh, review queue functions to uh, edit the existing routing list associated with a request. So again, those are the tabs in a little bit of detail. Again, just to go in and take a look at a Dalhousie request, again, just to show you, if I do click on the delivery information tab, this is where, in addition to uh, the brief information that we saw when we were looking at a non-Dalhousie request, you can see that I now am able to review and edit or change any of the messaging and delivery related information associated with the request in question. And here is my request routing tab. And again, I'm getting access to the request routing tab in this case because I am associated with this request. This is a Dalhousie lending request, so I should have the ability to change the routing list. When I was looking at the memorial patron request from Dalhousie's perspective, I shouldn't have the ability to adjust the routing list. That's memorial's responsibility to deal with that. So in our request routing tab, again, this should look very familiar. We, we tried to make it look and feel as similar to the request routing function that you would have seen both in the old access pages and in the Windows environment. We have our list of internal and external suppliers broken down into all the categories that we had before. If you wish to add a supplier uh, into the routing list, it would simply be a matter of highlighting that supplier and clicking add to list. That will add the supplier to the list and you can use the yeah, able Please do, Wilma. Can we have Belgium in Italy and Canada removed from internal? I'm sorry, was the question, can you have Italy and Canada removed? And Belgium. Yes, absolutely. These, again, whoever's inside of here, we would just need to move somewhere else. Um, so again, oh, once okay. these suppliers were created, they were created against a, these are really, uh, I call them dummy, library records. That's what gives us our grouping. So all of these suppliers are associated with a library called Canada. Um, if you still use these suppliers, then we would, in addition to getting rid of the group, we would need to re reseed these under another uh, common topic. So, but that's different countries under our internal issues. Yeah, quite strange. And that again, we'll take a we should take a closer look at these because yeah, if these are internal suppliers, they should really be listed under one of your consortium members. And something's gone astray when this one was created. This is probably created as an internal supplier, which it really is not. So um we'll do some cleanup there. Again, what I ask is if you could just fire off a, a support. Uh, incident report and just ask that can we take a look at the list of internal suppliers, specifically the Belgium, the Canada, and the Italy, and reseed those properly either as external suppliers or under the specific internal groups. That makes sense? Yeah. Thank you, Mark. No worries. I have a question as well. Yes. It's a kit from Memorial. So, when if uh, my user makes a request and uh, the system doesn't find any other libraries, it automatically gets parsed to my library. So when I need to push that request to other libraries, when I go into this list, I can see my library as the one it went to first, which is grayed out and I can't delete it or remove it from the supplier list. And I can add libraries, but it won't go anywhere because it just keeps going back to my library because I'm at the top of the list. Okay. Um, I'd like to see an example of that. And that's it. That's not through the staff interface. Is that correct? Is that through the Windows environment or is that through the staff portal? Through the, the, the staff portal, like, uh, yes. Um, so if I use the desktop version, I can delete me. Like, that's not a problem, but okay. I can't do it through the staff portal. I don't know why it's grayed out and it won't let me delete it. Okay, um, what I would ask you there as well, if you could put that as an incident with an example, and we could sure. take a look at that, because again, this functionality should be, uh, again, we've, we've attempted to replicate it identically to what it was before. The ability to alter the current supplier associated with the request, which is what the top supplier in the routing list is, is dependent on where the request is in the system. If it's already been sent, been sent to that supplier, then you have to 
uh, either update that as a an exception code, an unfill code, or a document supply code to get it off of there. You can't just go in and delete the current supplier. So that might be what the issue is. Yeah, because I, I, I would be the supplier, but I don't have, because it just came to me because my patron made a request and it's there's no other suppliers listed. Okay. Right. So it is so so it's in the scanner update queue at that point. Well, it's yeah, but I mean, I've already printed it and processed it and all of that kind of stuff, and I can change it in the desktop, but I can't do anything to it here. So I can't parse it to another library from the, the from the portal. Okay, and we'll we'll take that one and we'll look at it as an incident itself. But from the perspective of the request routing, the functionality should allow you to add locations to the routing list and okay. reposition them if the request is in the scanner update or the processing section of your request flow, essentially, then you won't be able to change the current supplier associated with the request. You'd have to, you'd have to process it from the current supplier to get it to go to the next supplier in the routing list. Mm -hmm. If you were building the routing list, going through request routing from the, um, from the search manual application, for example, you should be able to change the current supplier because the request hasn't gone to that supplier yet. So again, as I said, like to see your incident specifically with your request and find out what's going on with that request, but uh, it's supposed to work the same as Windows. <laughs> I found that if you are the only one in the list, you cannot delete yourself. Something else must be added to the list before you can delete your own incident. And that may be true, is that you'll notice that we don't have the delete highlighted until we have another location in the list too. So Even if I add a bunch of lit people for uh, other locations in the list, I still remind grayed out and can't delete and it just keeps sending it back to me. Okay. I can't push it to anyone else. So I, I will have to create a, a ticket on that. So, cause I'm not sure why it's doing that. And we'll take a look at it, find out what's going on. Absolutely. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. With respect to request routing, the other thing I'd like to point out is you may have noticed this first supplier overrides on this hand side of the screen, so the right hand side, this hand side. Um, what that's referring to is for your current supplier, we have the ability to set the supplier's need by date and the max cost that would go out to the supplier that's identified in the top of the routing list. And again, if you'll bear with me, let's just see if I've got, uh, well, I can't see it from there, sorry. I'm gonna go out of here. I'm gonna go to my requesting side of the house and I'm gonna take a look one of the PDA requests that are in here and go to request route. Ooh, review on a full routing list that purchase. I'm seeing a trend here. Okay. Last try AEU. Okay. Um, so for AEU, Again, that's my current supplier. You can see it highlighted. If I set the need by date uh, and set the max cost, if I was in search manual again, creating this routing list, when the request is to the first supplier in the routing list, these are the overrides that are going to be used to send the request to that supplier. So that if you do have a specific supplier service level override that you want to set for the request, or you have a specific max cost that you want to define for that supplier or a need by date from that supplier, it can be set for the first supplier in the routing list. Once the request goes to the next supplier in the routing list, these values don't hold true. And you can only set it for the first supplier in the list. And again, this mirrors the functionality that we did have in the Windows application with him as well. So those are your tabs. Again, going back to our side menu options. I did mention that we are breaking up monitor queues into the requesting side of the house and into the supplying side of the house. So if we're looking at the supplying side of the house, in this case, we see that there are uh, some requests within our search catalog section. And again, I can't expand that to see what queues they're in right at the moment. And I noticed that this morning, Joe, I'll have to figure out what's going on with the view of those 22 requests. I do see that requests are in the distribute request section of the request flow. And here is where we've got nine requests that are in the NSHD print queue. So I'm going to go ahead and click nine requests. And again, what you will see is 
I get my grid of those nine requests. Because this is a print queue, you will note that we do have the ability to actually invoke the printing of requests from the portal now. So again, if you're printing pick slips normally through the print request application, you will have the ability to print requests in the queue at this point in time. Now, I don't want to do this here, Joe, because uh, again, they'll print to my house and that won't be useful to anybody else. But if you'll bear with me, I'm just going to go in to my RC environment, which I've got open, logging back in again because we've logged out. And again, what this will do is if I scroll down to my supplying side of the house, in my print requests, I've got three requests that I put in earlier today. If I click print requests, what that will do again, just like we saw for view request, is it will, if the system cooperates and it's trying, open up a new window. Oops. Back. Please open. And unfortunately, somebody's fouling up my RC environment, so it's not going to work today. Wonderful. Um, lousy. What that should do, and apologies, um, it will call up that same looking view of requests that we saw for an individual request, but is it is actually going to uh, produce um, produce a PDF that includes all of the requests that are in that um, queue at the time. So in this case of Dalhousie here, we would see uh, electronic representation of all nine of these uh, pick slips to be generated in order to order based on the sort order that's configured for that queue for Dalhousie within the portal environment. So again, if you're going to the stacks and you want to go in uh, supplier code, title, and call number order for this particular print queue. We certainly will have that configured. If you've got another location that's uh, sorted all by call number, we will make that sort order call number instead, et cetera, et cetera. Again, once you've printed from that uh, other window, uh, you will come back to this window, and the option that is going to be replacing print requests in a queue is the um, the retry print request. And the reason that that in is if your staff inadvertently go to the other window to process those requests and they actually forget to print or the print failed for some reason, we don't want you coming back and not having the ability to print the request. So if you come back to this screen and don't go anywhere else, you'll see that option that will allow you to again reinvoke the print request. Uh, thinking that there must have been a failure in the print, and you will be able to print those items in the queue. Does that make sense? And without anybody saying no, I am going to just yes. So again, under requesting, under supplying, we have queues. These queues are based on, again, your request flow. So just like monitor queue, so requesting from supplying, and again, we have, when we look at a print queue, we can configure the print queue to be, um, to be uh, invoking of that print request in a queue function. The search queues, again, and apologies for some reason here, I don't seem to see my search queues at this point in time on the Dalhousie environment. Let's go back to my, heaven forbid, my, no, it's gone on. RC environment, and let's take a look at the search and the different ways that we can invoke search. So again, if I wish to conduct a Z3950 search against configured targets, for an item or for for an item that somebody wishes to request and I don't have a request in the system, that is what this search staff or sorry staff search function is all about. Um, when you access the staff search function, you may be greeted with a variety of different search group options. These would group your various Z3950 targets. 
typically in a relay ILL environment, we will have the first group. And again, apologies, this is my RC environment where we're testing renaming of something. My group north would usually have a label called lending. My group east may have a, a group called consortia or call where I would search all of the call environments to do a search. Um, if you're searching a catalog like voila, you may have that independently set up so that you can search those. I'm going to select my East group. This is actually going to go out and search a variety of targets in Maryland. And I'm just going to type in a typical search for something like Steve Jobs. What you'll see happening is the search that's being conducted is a federated search. It's going out and it's searching all of the configured targets that you have at the same time and it is merging the result sets back and it's matching based on the title, the author, and the publication date associated with the item. So that if I was looking for uh, Steve Jobs by Walter Isaacson in 2011, I know that all of these targets have found results for it. If I select that item, again, because I don't have a request yet, um, I am going to be asked to define who do I want to submit the request on behalf of. Is that a patron or is that a library? Again, I presume the answer to this question is most likely going to be um, patron the majority of the time because I wouldn't imagine that another library is going to ask you to do a search for them and place a request for them uh, all on their own. Again, in my RC environment, not surprisingly, I've identified my patron. Again, if you have their barcode or you have their first name, last name, if more than one um, more than one match is found, you will get a grid and be asked to select. If none of the items are found and you're using NSIP, you will be asked to enter in a user ID and PIN and whatnot, and that will be used to go out and find the patron uh, that you might be looking for. When you select them, requestability logic inherent in Relay is going to go out and it's actually going to go out to all of those configured targets, identify from those targets which uh, material formats that target is allowed to supply from. If we've registered locations that can service the request from the variety of different we've got, it will then also consider is the location that the material is held in uh, a requestable location. It will look at the availability status of the item. So in the case of a book, when we know we've got availability status for each individual copy, it will look at that to find out that there's at least one available copy. And again, from there, it's going to return an availability statement. In this case, um, my, my item is actually held at Pratt because in my configuration, Pratt is my library. So I've got a, um, an item that is known to be held in my own local location, which is fine. I have the option of either clicking to transfer and do a deep link, or I can actually decide, well, maybe this is a distance edu education patron and I may wish to submit the request. Again, if I click submit request, I can enter additional information, including additional information about the specific volume that they might need, any additional notes that might make it more helpful to identify the specific piece of material validate my messaging and my delivery information associated with the request, acknowledge any acknowledgements that you wish to acknowledge to place the request. And again, I can either submit the request as it is, or if I care to update my routing list and move things around for the routing list that was apparent, compared, uh, sorry, prepared by requestability, I can do that by simply selecting the location or locations associated with the existing routing list and moving them up and down. Again, this is my RC environment, so I will go ahead and submit this shortly, but I just thought I'd show you as well. In addition to all of the locations that can service the request, I may have other information about other locations that can, can't service the request. And again, I can see those non-available locations, seeing that there are some that have different due dates. Again, Steve Jobs is held in a variety of different spots with a variety of different copies. So not surprisingly, there's a lot of lists to go through. Again, your routing list can include up to uh, 12 locations in the relay routing list. If we have available suppliers that exceed those 12, you'll see the first 12 highlighted in, in white until I butchered them and started selecting them and made them yellow. Any of the other locations that are requestable, 
uh, that aren't in white will appear in gray and you'll know that you can just again highlight a gray item and move it up into the white area or the yellow area as we've got now to indicate that they are now part of the active routing list that I've prepared. And again, we've got this little statement here just to remind you that you can have 12 in the routing list. When you're happy with the routing list, we simply click submit. Sorry. I'm stuck on something. There we go. Oh, and I've forgotten to fill out my copyright detail. That's why we're not going anywhere. When I click submit request, again, you'll get your request number confirmation suggesting that, hey, you're ready to go. I can either revise my search, I can select another item, another request on behalf of this person, or select other function from the staff menu to move on. So again, that is the staff search functionality uh, in a nutshell uh, to create a request uh, following a search of any of the configured targets that you've got um, for which a request doesn't already exist in the system. If you actually have a search manual queue and you wish to add the search manual functionality to that queue, we can do so. Again, much like our print request queue where we highlighted that that queue is a print queue, we can identify that we want to have access to the search functionality from any queue, whether it be a review queue, a search manual queue, but of course the search manual queue by default makes sense. So when I click on a request that's in the queue, you will note that in the bottom area underneath the request constant data, I am greeted with what looks like an advanced search screen. Because I am selecting to do, conduct a search against a request that exists in the system, the system will pull out all the relevant title, author, ISSN information and whatnot that you could use to do the search. Again, I am defaulting to a select group. I can change that group and move that group to whatever. If I clear that item out of there and I put in my own search terms, I can certainly do that. And again, when I click search, it's going to go out and it's going to tell me whether or not the item in question uh, finds any results. And again, I get my same list of results that I saw before. I can select my Walter Isaacson from the location list and you'll notice I have an availability list that comes up automatically. I can submit the request based on this routing list. If I click update the routing list, then what happens is that request is now processed. And once I refresh my window, again, if we'll note back at the top here, we have eight requests in the queue, eight requests right here. If I move on to another request, simply click to refresh my queues, you will note that that request is now gone. If I close it out of the list, I now have, again, sorry, I'm just gonna, well, go back into the search manual queue. I now have my seven requests in the queue. So that request has gone on. So again, that's utilizing the search from the portal environment. The advantage to the portal uh, is that again, it is a federated search. It searches all of your catalogs all at once and pulls the list of merged records together based on title, author, and publication date. And from there, requestability is called to confirm that the material that's been requested or selected can actually be serviced from that supplier based on configuration for what formats do they support, what shelving locations do they deem to be requestable, uh, whether the shelving status of the item is available or not, uh, et cetera. Again, when we were working with, um, uh, Boy, I'd like to say Acadia, but I can't remember. When we were looking at uh, one of our earliest customers and also working with UNB uh, to get their WMS target squared away, we did realize that there is a deficiency in the staff search right now. When you are searching for a journal, the volume and issue information does not always display um, depending on which target you're searching. And if you bear with me for a moment, I'm just gonna go up, I think category five might be NEOS. If I look for a magazine, which everybody seems to own. Oh, wrong target. 
Let's do my revised search. Maybe there's six or four or three. I had them all nicely named in the RC environment until just recently. No, obviously not six. So. Oh, well, I'm not going to worry about it again. Um, when the search results come up, some targets actually have defined the volume and issue information within the call number field that is displayed in our grid results for each location that can service the request. That isn't always the case. Uh, hopefully, you'll be happy to hear that within this quarter of development, which runs from October to December, we have undertaken to display volume and issue detail coming back from the variety of different targets that you might search again. So we have gone out and taken a look at the triple I's, the Voyagers, the um, Polaris's, the Circe's, the whomever ILS's, and taken a look at the uh, results coming back from all the Z3950 targets to identify where volume and issue is being defined as well as any summary holding statements that may exist. And we will now be displaying that information when you're looking at a journal within that grid result so that you can request off to an external supplier that they do have the volume and issue that you're looking for. So again, look forward to that development at the end of this quarter, at the end of December, uh, i.e. rolled out in January. So that's the search in a nutshell. Is there any question on the search? I have a question. Yeah. Are you tired of me yet? <laughs> Pardon me? I asked if you were tired of me yet. No, not at all. <laughs> if I want to put in a, uh, a request for a, for a patron on their behalf, yeah. and I don't find it when I do a search, can I still add a patron request? Uh, do you find nothing or do you find something? You just don't find locations that can service the request? Usually our distance ed students, we put in the request on their behalf. Yeah. And not always am I able to find something, but I need to have a record that, yes, I have tried this. So, yeah. you know, right now using the Windows environment, I can add a request under a patron's name. That makes sense? Yes, it does. Um, and very good question. I have a feeling that might be a deficiency. Um, let me just see if I can just put in that. Should get no result. Yeah, we do not have the ability to place a request for something that you haven't been able to match for a supplier at this point in time. Again, the idea is uh, we'll have to add that to the uh, list of enhancements and schedule that in our app. It is not cer certainly something that we can't squeeze in this development quarter. Uh, we don't have any capacity, but I will add that to the list of enhancement requests. Um, yeah, that we don't have. Again, yeah, the, thank you. yeah good question. Anything else on the search? Okay, and as suggested, the search functionality that you saw in the, uh, on my environment where I had put it into search manual, there is nothing to suggest that when you go into review list exhausted and click on a request, we couldn't also add the search feature, right? So you could go out and search your catalogs from the review list exhausted queue. So if you did have a second or third or fifth tier of locations that you would go to and you would have to resubmit to search manual, in the Windows environment, rather than doing that, we can just configure the application or sorry, the review queue application queue to present the search option when you desire it. Does that make sense? And again, nobody's saying yes or no, so I'll assume that's okay. So in addition to our queues, which again see in requesting, 
and we see our supplying cues. We have, by the way, the ability to suppress a variety of cues. So in a consortial environment, you may see your requests that reside uh, in somebody else's print cues and whatnot. If that's the case, we can suppress those. You don't need to see your patron requests residing in somebody else's print queue because you don't want to print those. You want them to be printed by another consortium member. Um, so hopefully the configures, configurations have been done properly there. Again, depending on where the request in, is in the request flow, you may have access to all of the tabs of information or a limited set of tabs. So if I'm looking at the process and complete queue, why we have stuff in create update file, I'm not too sure. If I look at this, you'll notice I don't have access to the loan tab or the um, supply tab or the unfilled tab because the request has gone past that part of the process. In this case, we know that the request has probably been put on loan. Um, so just to point that out. In addition to our queues, we also have the ability to access some information about requests that have been processed on loan. So request side of the house and supply side of the house, you may see our loan block. And in the loan block, it's just going to tell you you have two items on the requesting side of the house that have been recalled. Their current loan status is recalled. So uh, again, uh, looking at this and I'm seeing this from Dalhousie's perspective at this point in time, and I'm seeing two memorial requests. Oh, sorry, this is my RC environment. Why am I here? Let's go back to you. There we go. So on my, again, I'm just gonna suppress these with apologies, thought I was on your environment. So in our loan tab, I see I've got four requests where I've sent an overdue status. So if I wanna take a look at those requests, here are my four Dalhousie uh, patron requests that are currently overdue. Again, if I wanna double click on any of those, I will see additional information associated with those requests. Why this is important is, well, because you, you may want to do something with these requests at some point in time. Again, if the request isn't overdue or if it was recalled or otherwise, perhaps there's a status update. The current staff portal environment does not allow you to do loan tracking functionality other than to return an item currently. So you can loan something and you can mark it as returned. However, as noted during our RUG meeting just last month, in this order we are uh, as part of our ISO 18626 development, developing the loan tracking functionality that you have in your Windows environment through that loan tracking function and that you had in the old relay access forms to be able to mark something as lost or damaged or renewed or recalled or wrong item shipped. All of those other loan status updates will be presented to you from the loan tab environment uh, in the release again, rolled out sometime in early January once development is done at the end of this quarter. So for now, the loan options down here, at least giving you access to from the relay environment, what is what are my requests that are out on loan and what is their existing status? I can see there's 74 requests that are out on loan on my requesting side of the house. There are about 29 of these that are in some form of an overdue status. I've got uh, 40 of them that I've sent a renewal notice to, and I've got one renewed response coming back. In addition to our queues and our loans, you have the ability to create a variety of other predefined queries to allow you to access a request or group of requests in the relay environment based on a SQL query, and that SQL query needs to start with select request number from, so that I can get either one request or a variety of requests that meet whatever that predefined query result happens to be. And again, for Dalhousie, you can see that we have many, many, many predefined queries that we've got for a variety of different reasons that can be called at any time from the side menu, either from the requesting side or again from the um, from the uh, supplying side of the house. So it takes care of the side menu in general. Uh, I believe, uh, again, I have talked about the loan tab. Again, the loan tab allows you to 
Uh, again, depending on where the request is, either loan the item or if the item has been loaned and you come back into the request, as is the case here, you'll have the ability to return that item, i.e. it's the loan tracking return function um, from the portal. Again, in the upcoming release, we will see additional loan tracking options display to allow you to do damaged, lost, uh, renew, recall, et cetera, et cetera. Our bib info tab, delivery info tab, and request info tab replicate your edit request functionality. Your request routing function, uh, again, should replicate the functionality you see throughout the Windows application when you see request routing as an option. Again, we know that we're expecting to see a support incident to try and figure out what's going on with the current supplier for one of the call members. Um, and uh, again, that's it from there. I'm just going through my notes, so bear with me. We've got query, we talked about export, we talked about staff search, change password, the side menus, requesting and supplying, loan predefined queries, staff processing. And what I meant by staff processing is, again, when you're calling up a request, whether you query the request or pull a request from a queue, the system is trying to determine which, tab to dis which tabs to display and which tab to make uh, active when you first call up the request based on logic, based on where the request is in the system. So again, it is quite slick in that respect. I've talked about the delivery info, request info tabs, the request routing tab, the loan tab, the supply tab, unfill and cancel. Um, and again, I'm gonna go back to my portal environment only for a moment. And the reason for that is I didn't see it configured within the call environment currently, but one of the latest and greatest updates that we've made to uh, request processing is, and again, this is just within our last release. Oops, gone too far. Let's see if I can find a request. No. Oh, let's see. Let's go up here. There we go. The unfill tab now has two options. We have our default unfilled options that display in the Dalhousie environment right at the moment. And again, this mirrors your request processing function where if you were to select your unfill reasons from the right hand side of the request processing screen, you're getting your list of unfill options again all your various unfill reasons in whatever sorted order that you have configured. If you will recall from the Windows environment under the options menu, there is an option called cancel request. Also from the old Relay Access forms, we had a similar button called cancel. And what that would allow you to do is select a cancellation reason. Again, could be the same list of reasons that you saw from the unfill tab um, or not can be a, a smaller listing if you prefer. And by selecting any one of these locations, the request will be deemed to be canceled with a final cancellation code, rather than potentially routing to the next supplier in the routing list. So in my case for PMF, uh, blah, 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 a patron request, if I was to do a loan from the unfill tab, read them on loan, are you? There you are. You'll notice that the next supplier in the routing list is going to be another location, OT, whoever that might be. And the request, when I click update, would route to OTCH and hope that they could service the request. If I instead select cancel option from inside the cancel on field and select item on loan, you'll notice I do not have a next supplier. That is indicating that when selected as a cancellation, and clicking update, that request is going to be moved out of the scanner update queue, deemed to be a final cancellation code and moved down to delivery to message the patron and say, I'm sorry, you're not getting the request because the item's on loan. Questions on that? Okay. We've talked about our web-based printing. We've talked about our view and reprint request options and our export requests. The last, and I'm sorry, I'm going a little bit late. I think I told us to go to 2.15 knowing that I'm a little bit long-winded on things. 
the uh, one of the options that Joe Wickens had requested that we talk about as well is uh, implications for the um, post web option that's coming up. So again, if you're familiar with discussions that we've had within the last user group meetings, both in the later in the spring and in October, uh, Relay has a requirement to um, to decommission our older post to web environment because it is uh, fraught with some security concerns for hardware and whatnot at this point in time. We have, as of, uh, I think it was after the April release, rolled out version 2020.2, which has our new post to web functionality built into it. The new post to web functionality, unlike the existing post to web, and maybe I'll take a step back. The existing post to web, if you'll remember, if a patron places a request and they've asked for post to web delivery and you attach a document or scan a document, the system will process that request through delivery email and an email will be sent to the patron with a link once when, when they click on it will present the image to them in their browser. Um, the new post to web functionality will no longer do that. It will send an email to the patron, but it will that email link when they click on it will direct the patron to your portal environment, requiring them to log in so that we know it is the patron who's looking for the image and the image will be presented to them. So I've taken the liberty of creating an email a little bit earlier in the day and let me close out that window. And so again, I've got a, a please apologize. I apologize. The configuration of this email message is configured to do a variety of testing. So it says I've got one page. I've got a 23K document, which is true, but it says uh, I only have access to it one time. Uh, again, I've changed the statements in here. Uh, and again, you can to configure this message to whatever you want it to read. We will pass to the patron or to the library the cover page associated with the request. So if I select that, I can see that the request was for the Journal of Organic Chemistry. I have a variety of pages I would be expecting from the image. And you'll notice my link. If I click on my link, which I have just done, the system will take me to my portal environment and ask me to log in. Again, um, for my login, this is a patron request, I believe. So that was me. And you'll notice that when the patron logs in, they will be greeted with the image that they were looking that they were looking to receive. Again, it's this is a one page image. If it was more than one, you can go to the next and the previous pages. You can zoom out and whatnot. And again, you'll notice that on my browser, there is no option to print from here. Again, that's browser specific. If I close out of this, again, you will see that the request that that image was processed against does have access to the article link in the grid. So that if the next time the patron is coming to the portal environment and taking a look at all of their open requests and happens to open up this request, they will see and can click on that uh, file view or article link or document or whatever you wanna call a nice hyperlink here. The hyperlink also appears down in the uh, the um, constant data associated with the request as well. And if you'll remember from your environment, we also by default have provided a documents received query that'll go out and show you all of the various documents that have been received. And if I was to find my request 819, you will see that there is my view file associated with that as well. And if I click on that again, I have X number of views to be able to view this. If I extinguish my number of views or the number of days passes, I will get an error message. I'm just gonna click on another one of these. Here we are. So again, the image is no longer available, blah, blah, blah. In this case, you have the ability to key in a message and click submit. And when clicking submit, that will fire off an email to staff at whatever configured email address we have associated with that uh, message request. Again, it's typically your ILL email address for your institution. And staff will have the ability through the staff interface to reset the number of views and the number of days that the 
request is available, presuming that image file hasn't been purged already. Does that help answer the questions, Joe, about what you were hoping to see for the post to web? Yes, perfectly. Thank you so much. I wasn't quite sure I could I could picture it up to the login point, but then I wasn't quite sure what happened after that. And and voila, there it is. Good. Marvelous. And again, I think we had put a video together on that with the release time, so it should be in or a couple of times ago to show this. Oh, okay. The other thing that we have is when you're again your institutions. If any institution is requesting post to web, the same thing is going to happen. Mm -hmm. Again, going to direct them to your library pages. Um, there was some discussion during the user group meetings that, oh, does that mean we have to create user IDs and passwords for all of those libraries? The answer at the time was yes, but Abhijit and the, the uh, development team are working on a solution that would create a uh, user ID and a password for any institutions that don't have one already in your system and to pass that along in the URL uh, in encrypted fashion so that you can't even tell it's there. So the libraries won't have to log in. We'll take them to the login page. It'll automatically have the credentials to log in. And the difference between a library and a patron seeing the image is the library is going to have a download link that's available right at the top right hand corner of the image so that they can download it after they view it. So no, that's the only good. Thing. Yeah. Now, now, would you be able to, like you say, for those that don't have a login? It'll, uh -huh. it, even if they, sorry, and if you already have provided user IDs and passwords to institution, we'll use those. And again, we'll encrypt them and pass them along. Oh, good. So, yeah. So, so again, that's from a library good. standpoint, you'll just get directed to the portal environment uh, for the, the call portal environment and be logged in and see the image right in front of you right away. So. Very good. And when will this, when, when's the. That's a really good question. I, I am. Uh, I think the development is going to be finished on that probably sometime next week, and we will likely do a hot fix release for that. So, okay, so before so the end of the year? It will be certainly before the end of the year. Remember that we need to have people migrating over to the new postal web before the end of the year, so this is a priority for us to get out. So I just don't have a date on when that hot fix will be rolled out. And again, the, the implication is on the server side of the house, so we'll be able to plot that in without any to do. Um, it's a delivery email uh, update that's going to be needed to be done for that. Yeah. And that all the um, all the call members will have to be updated to 2020 by then too as well. That's correct. And the reason that we need the Windows environment to be updated is um, because there are there is code in some of the applications that deals with post to web, your relay file transfer service needs to be updated as well. Again, we put a list of of uh, of steps that need to be done, uh, and pass those along not too long ago. I can refresh those and pass them to you again. And I've asked Nick anytime he's providing a support update to remind people that they need to get migrated over before uh, the end of December. And again, when we say the end of December. We don't really mean December 31st, please. We mean <laughs> as, as well in advance of that as possible because there will be Christmas closure, there will be holidays and whatnot. And, uh, we don't want to leave this to the last minute if we can avoid it. So, Okay. Well, that's good. Well, thanks. Thanks for showing, showing us around. Um, okay. No, I'm, I, a big part of this was just, just as, as I say, being shown around because I wasn't really sure what we're even supposed to see mm -hmm. inside the, the staff portal. So I wasn't, I probably, I remember Deborah uh, configuring like, you know, the catalog configurations and all that stuff. So I thought all the, you know, the search manual stuff was, was in there and, and I thought I'd even looked at it at some point. So I'm not, I'm not sure. I was in yesterday, Joe, just uh, uh, I don't leave the demos just to chance like this. I was in yesterday oh. and uh, when I came in at lunchtime, I noticed where to go. Uh, so somebody oh, okay. must have something and fouled something up in the branch is my guess. Um, so we'll have to reinstitute re it. So my humblest apology. Seems to oh, have good. No, I thought, it, yeah, I thought it was just something <laughs> that I missed the first time around. But no, OK, good, good. That's why I went in to check my user ID to say, am I really associated with Dalhousie? Because I'm not doing this stuff. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. Well, so I guess. Then, uh, 
just just okay. as a final thought here, and again, we have a couple minutes is again, what we're really trying to do from a development standpoint uh, for OCLC, this relay office is to get all of the functionality that you've within the Windows environment. Well, I'll say all oh, the key and, and critically important functionality uh, migrated over to the staff portal as quickly as possible so that you don't have to rely on those older Windows applications as much moving forward. Uh, again, based on our user group meetings, we do know that, again, once we get the loan tracking functionality and review alerts, which comes in, in conjunction with that, um, in the, the real missing pieces for process requests from the day-to-day -day activity for staff is that general messaging and notify patron. And again, we've always kicked that development down the road um, because there's workarounds. You can use your emails and whatever else, but we do have that slotted for our January to March development. Uh, and when that's in there, the functionality that is in Windows that isn't in the portal for staff processing are things like library registration and patron registration, table maintenance, their maintenance, and again, hopefully those lesser used functions that don't impact your day to day. And again, would make the portal staff processing interface, your primary interface and having to go to Windows only in the event that you had to do one of those select features. So that's really what we're trying to get at. And that's why during those user group meetings, we were asking what are the, the primary functions that are missing from the staff portal that you need to have to consider a full transition away. So that's where we're trying to get to here. Are there any other questions or concerns about anything associated with the staff interface? Well, with that, then I'd like to thank you all for participating again. Sorry that we had to jump back between RC environments and uh, Dalhousie environment a little bit, but hopefully everybody found it useful. Again, this session has been recorded and I will be posting this again to our uh, North American user group list so that you'll have access to it. And again, um, if there are any other questions or concerns that come up, please don't hesitate to ask. Thank you very much, Mark.